Airborne by Kenneth Appel, a first chapter Friday read aloud with the word nerd. Today as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Hey everybody, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week I'm going to read to you from Airborne by Kenneth Appel. And normally I read you the whole first chapter, but the first chapter of this book is like 34 pages long, and that would just be way too long for you guys to get through in class. So I cut it in half and I'll read you about half of the first chapter, but it's totally going to give you enough to know whether you want to finish the rest of it. Now I know this book is uh, big and thick, but if you are looking for a book with tons of adventure, a book that has all sorts of amazing uh, twists and turns and will keep you on your toes, you are absolutely going to love it. I kind of call it an oldie but a goodie because it was published in 2004, probably before most of you were born. Uh, but you can see from the sticker on the front that it's an award winner um, and it's fantastic and I loved it and I only bring you guys the best books. Um, before I read you, um, those first 16 pages. I want to tell you a little bit about the author Kenneth Appel. Um, earlier uh, this month on this channel, I shared with you the book Restart by Gordon Corman, and I told you that he wrote his very first book when he was in seventh grade. Gordon and Kenneth kind of have that thing in common. Listen in. Kenneth was born in 1967 in Vancouver Island, British Columbia. That's just northwest of Washington State. When he was 12, he decided that he was going to be a writer when he grew up. He warmed up his writing skills with science fiction. He calls it his Star Wars phase. And then moved into swords and sorcery tales, his Dungeons and Dragons phase. The summer he turned 14, he wrote a short novel about a boy addicted to video games. Soon after it was completed, a friend of Mr. Appel's family heard about it and offered to pass it along to a friend of his, the famous Roll Doll author of, among other things, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Mr. Dahl liked the story so much that he passed it on to his literary agents, who promptly decided to take the book on. He sold the rights to a publishing company, and Colin's fantastic video adventure was released in 1985, when Mr. Appel was just 18. So again, this is just a little reminder to you that if you have dreams of writing, uh, you don't have to wait until you're a grown-up to get those things started. So pretty please, the world needs your stories, uh, start writing them down. But let's talk a little bit more uh, about this specific book, Airborne. Here's what the back of the book has to say. Matt Cruz has a life he has always dreamed of as a cabin boy on the Aurora, a luxury passenger airship that sails hundreds of feet above the ocean. Then one night he meets a dying balloonist who speaks of beautiful creatures drifting through the skies who are completely real and utterly mysterious. And Matt decides to go on a quest to find those creatures. Chapter one of Airborne by Kenneth Appel is called Ship's Eyes. Sailing toward dawn, I was perched atop the crow's nest, being the ship's eyes. We were two nights out of Sydney and there had been no weather to speak of so far. I was keeping watch on a dark stack of nimbus clouds off to the northwest, but we were leaving it far behind and it looked to be smooth going all the way back to Lionsgate City, like riding a cloud. The sky pulsed with stars. Some people say it makes them lonesome when they stare up at the night sky, but I can't imagine why. There's no shortage of company. By now, there's not a constellation I can't name. Orion, Lupus, Serpens, Hercules, Draco. My father taught me all their stories, so when I look up, I see a galaxy of adventures and heroes and villains, all jostling together and trying to outdo one another. And I sometimes want to tell them to hush up and not distract me with their chatter. I've glimpsed all the stars ever discovered by astronomers and plenty that haven't been. There are planets to look at too, depending on the time of year. Venus, Mercury, Mars, and don't forget old man on the moon. I know every crease and pockmark on that face of his. My watch was almost at an end, and when I was looking forward to climbing down in my bunk, sliding under warm blankets and into a deep sleep, even though it was only September and we were crossing the equator, it was still cool at night up in the crow's nest, parting the winds at 75 miles an hour. I was grateful for my fleece-lined coat. Spyglass to my face, I slowly sweep the heavens. Here at the Aurora summit, shielded by a glass observation dome, I had a 360-degree view of the sky around and above the ship. The lookout's job was to watch for weather changes and other ships. Over the Pacificus, you didn't see much traffic, though earlier I'd caught a distant flicker of a freighter plowing the waves toward the Orient. But boats were of no concern to us. We sailed 800 feet above them. 
The smell of fresh baked bread wafted up to me. Far below in the ship's kitchens, they were taking out the first loaves and rolls and cinnamon buns and croissants and danishes. I inhaled deeply. A better smell than this I couldn't imagine, and my stomach, stomach gave a hungry twist. In a few minutes, Mr. Riddehoff would be climbing the ladder to take watch, and I could swing past the kitchen and see if the ship's baker was willing to part with a bun or two. He almost always was. A shooting star lit the sky. That made 106 I'd seen this season. I'd been keeping track. Boz and I had a little contest going, and I was in the lead by 12 stars. Then I saw it, or didn't see it, because at first I, all I noticed was a blackness where the stars should have been. I raised my spyglass again and, with the help of the moon, caught a glimpse. It was a hot air balloon, hanging there in the night sky. Its running lights weren't on, which was odd. The balloon was higher than us by about a hundred feet, drifting off our starboard bow. The burner came on suddenly, jetting blue flame to the heat the air balloon's envelope for a few seconds. But I couldn't see anyone at the controls. They must have been set on a clockwork timer. Nobody was moving around in the gondola. It was deep and wide, big enough for a kind of sleeping cabin on one side and plenty of storage beneath. I couldn't ever recall seeing a balloon this far out. I lifted the speaking tube to my mouth. Crow's nest reporting. I waited a moment as my voice hurtled down through the tube 150 feet to the control car suspended from the Aurora's belly. Go ahead, Mr. Cruz. It was Captain Walken on watch tonight, and I was glad, for I much preferred him to the other officers. Some of them called me Cruz, or boy, figuring I wasn't worth a mister on account of my age, but never the captain. To him, I was always Mr. Cruz, and it got so that I'd almost started to think of myself as a mister. Whatever I was back in Lionsgate City on shore leave, and my mother or sister called me Matt. My own name sounded strange to me at first. Hot air balloon, at one o'clock, maybe half a mile off, a hundred feet up. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. There was a pause, and I knew the captain would be looking out the enormous wraparound windows of the control car. Because it was well set back from the bow, its view of anything high overhead was limited. And that's why there was always a watch posted in the forward crow's nest. The aurora needed eyes on top. Yes, I see it now. Well spotted, Mr. Cruz. Can you make out its markings? We'll train the light on it. Mounted at the front of the control car was a powerful spotlight. Its beam cut a blazing swath through the night and struck the balloon. It was in a sorry state, withered and puckered. It was leaking, or maybe the burner wasn't working properly. The endurance, I read into the spreaking tube. She looked like she'd endured a bit too much. Maybe a storm had punctured her envelope or bashed her about some. And still, no sign of the pilot in the gondola. Along the length of the speaking tube, I hear tiny murmurings from the control car as the captain conferred with the bridge officers. It's not in the flight plan, I heard Mr. Torbay, the navigator, say. Every airship had to register its flight plan before departing. If this vessel wasn't on the plan, it was either a rogue or it had drifted off course for some reason. Any sign of the pilot yet, Mr. Cruz? asked the captain. No, sir. We'll try to rise him on the wireless. I waited. The balloon was not really moving as the wind was so light. We were rapidly gaining. There was something eerie about it, just hanging there like a dead thing, all dark and listless in the sky. After a few moments, the captain's voice sounded over the speaking tube. We can't raise anyone on the endurance, Mr. Cruz. No signs of life? None, sir. I felt the slightest heaviness in my heels, and I knew that we were climbing, the aurora angling gently heavenward to meet the endurance. I lost sight of the gondola, and after a moment could only see the loon's very top as the captain took us closer. Through the crow's nest platform, I felt the ship's pulse slow as the propellers cut back. When you've been aloft for a long time, you can almost predict the ship's every movement through your own skin and sinew, like you're joined together. I heard the captain shouting out the control car window through a bullhorn. Endurance! This is the Aurora! Please respond! He said it again and again. If the pilot had been asleep, this should have roused him. But after a minute with no response, the captain gave up. Through the speaking tube, I overheard him talking to his rudder man. Come around, Mr. Kahlo. We'll bring her as close as we can and try to take the gondola on board. Likely someone's injured or abandoned ship. Either way, the endurance is in distress. We can't leave her drifting like flotsam through the sky lanes. Bring it on board? Now that would be a feat. A mid-air rescue would surely be tricky, but it was Skyway's loss to help another vehicle in distress. I heard footsteps coming up the ladder. 
My watch was over, and I was being relieved by Peter Riddahall, a third officer who was still junior enough to be expected to do crow's nest duty. Cruise? Mr. Riddahall? I filled him in on the balloon and handed over the spyglass. She's at three o'clock now, I pointed. You can just see your top. We're coming about. Pretty odd business, being over the Pacificus and nothing but a bag of hot air. I just shook my head. It seemed madness to be at the mercy of the winds like that, with no means of propulsion. I hope no one on board was hurt. Down the ladder I went through the webwork of iron, aluma iron beams and bracing wires that gave the aurora her rigid shape. On either side of me hung the walls of one of the enormous gas cells that keep us aloft. Their fabric, a miraculous substance called gold beater skin, glistened and rustled ever so slightly as I passed, like something alive and breathing. Perfuming the air was the faintest fragrance of ripe mangoes, the smell of the hydrium gas inside the cells. I dropped down onto the keel catwalk, the main thoroughfare. It ran the entire length of the ship from control car to office quarters and luxurious passenger decks near the bow all the way to the back and the cargo bays and the crew quarters and the stern. Normally after my watch I'd head back to my cabin for sleep, but I had no intention of doing so right now. I was too excited. I felt the ship turning and knew we were coming about to try to pick up the balloon. Mr. Carlo and two machinists were walking smartly aft toward the cargo bay, and I fell into step behind them. I wanted to see this. Besides, they might need an extra hand. The bay was stacked high with wooden crates and steamer trunks and oversized baggage, but a narrow path ran like a canyon through all of it and finally opened out into a large, clear area near the loading doors in the ship's hull. They were already There were already a number of sailmakers on the scene, plus the first officer, Paul Redou, talking to the ship's phone, no doubt with the captain. He caught a glimpse of me and didn't look entirely pleased. Mr. Rideau was a fine pilot, so everyone said, but he wasn't a favorite with the crew. He had a long, pale face and pale blue eyes and a reddish nose that made him, look, that made him sound plugged up, and he always looked like he was on the verge of an annoyed little sigh. You got the feeling that Mr. Rideau didn't much care for the crew, especially for a cabin boy like me. Aren't you off watch crews, he asked me, knowing that I was. Yes, sir, but requesting permission to remain and assist if needed. He sighed, very well, but get a harness on and stay well back. We'll be opening the bay doors in a moment. Everyone else was already suited up. From a row of hooks on the wall, I took down a leather harness and stepped into it. It fit snugly around my legs and chest with a long line clipped onto the mooring ring on the wall. At a nod from Mr. Rideau, two crewmen manned the bay doors. Instinctively, I spread my legs apart for balance. Once the doors were open, the wind, even though it was a gentle one, would come galloping in and knock us about. With a hiss, the two doors pulled in and rolled flush along the ship's hull. The winds, the drone of the engines, and the pungent smell of the tropical sea poured into the bay. Below, starlight painted the ocean silver. We were closing in on the balloon, the gondola hanging level with the cargo bay doors. The sound of the engines deepened as they slowed even further. Mr. Rideau kept talking into the phone, eyes fixed on the balloon, keeping the captain abreast of our position, and the captain would in turn be instructing his helmsman and telegraphing instructions to the machinists in our four engine cars. He wanted to bring the Aurora in as close as possible without fouling the balloon's rigging and our propellers. It was lucky the night was so calm, or this surely would have been impossible. Mr. Rideau hung up the phone and with a bullhorn raised his mouth tried to hail the balloon. Endurance! Please respond. This is the airship Aurora. Please respond. Endurance. Nothing. Probably some of our passengers were awake now. Most wouldn't have noticed the ship slowing and turning, but even through the soundproof walls and windows of their cabins and staterooms, that bullhorn would yank a few from their sleep. Damn nuisance, I heard Mr. Rideau mutter. Mr. Callow, Mr. Chen, grappling hooks. I watched as the two men took hold of their heavy lines, each tipped with a four-pronged grapple. The engines had all but stopped and the Aurora slid slowly alongside the balloon. The gondola was directly opposite us, a good fifty feet distant, I'd say. Heave! Mr. Rideau cried out, and the two men, their legs wide, twisted from the waist and let fly. Their loins coiled out into the night and both grapple hooks hit the rim of the gondola and held fast. Pull her in. Be quick about it. Mr. Rideau always had a way of sounding sharpish. Captain Walken would have said something like, Let's see if we can pull her in, gentlemen, when you're ready. He said please and thank you, always, even though he didn't need to. Orders were orders, but when they came with a please, he felt a lot better about following them. 
The men looped their lines onto the winches and started cranking. One arm hooked around a strut, Mr. Rideau leaned out and gazed from side to side, checking to make sure the balloon wasn't about to get snarled up in the propellers. Then he glanced at the balloon itself. Leave off, he shouted. This is as close as it gets. I moved near the bay doors and saw that the balloon and the aurora were very close to touching at their widest points. No one wanted a collision, even with something as soft as a balloon, for you never know if there was something sharp that would snag or tear. The problem was, even though the balloon and the aurora were almost touching at their curves, the gondola was still a good 30 feet away and sinking. I hadn't noticed it at first, but now it was obvious. It wasn't the aurora climbing, it was the balloon falling. Despite the occasional flare of its automated burner, it was sinking slowly but surely, and the sea would have her if we didn't have something to do about it. Keep her snug, Mr. Rideau barked at the men, and they locked their winches, trying to keep the gondola from falling further. Now there was a little below us I could see inside. The pilot was sprawled on the gondola's floor. Look, I cried. Still, the gondola was sinking, dropping away from us, its big balloon coming lower, with its fat girth falling ever closer to our propellers. Just then, Captain Watkins, Captain Watkins strode in. He was the kind of man everyone felt safer being around. If he'd been wearing a velvet robe and crown, he'd be the very image of a great king. And if he were a doctor's jacket, you'd trust him with his life, with your life. If he were in a carpenter's smock, you'd know he'd build you the finest house imaginable. But I preferred him in this blue captain's jacket with the four gold stripes on the sleeve and his cap encircled with thick gold cord. His beard and mustache were trim and he had a steady set of kind eyes. He was approaching 60 with a full head of gray curly hair and wide in the shoulders. He wasn't a particularly big man or even tall. When he, when he walked into a room, you could almost sense everyone exhaling with relief and thinking, there now, things will be just fine. The captain needed only to glance at the situation. Mr. Rideau, would you please return to the control car and assume my watch? I'll take over here, thank you. Yes, sir, said Mr. Rideau, but I could tell he didn't much like that order. Ready the davit, please, gentlemen, Captain Watkins said. Centered before the bay doors was a davit, a small crane with an extendable arm that swung out and raised and lowered cargo when we were docked. The crew sprang to it at once, manning the lines and wheeling out the davit's arm to full length. Let's see if she'll reach, the captain said. Swing her out, please. Breathless, I watched, wondering if it would be long enough. I knew what the captain had in mind. I kept looking down at the man on the gondola floor. He was deathly white in the flare of the aurora spotlight. But then I saw him stir slightly, and a hand twitch. The davit's arm slowly swung all the way out as far as it would go. It was still at least six feet shy of the gondola. Pity, the captain said calmly. Bring her back in, gentlemen. I looked down and saw that the water was close below us. The captain had vented a little hydrium to keep us level with the balloon, but now we had gone as low as we safely could. Any nearer was foolhardy, for you never know when a sudden gust or rogue front might clutch the ship and thrust her down into the drink. Well, gentlemen, we've not much time, the captain said. The situation is simple and our course of action is clear. Someone's going to need to hook themselves to the end of the davit and swing across to the gondola. It's the only way to get to her before she goes down. He looked across at Mr. Kahlo and Mr. Chen, and the machinists and sailmakers, their faces gray in the starlight, none relishing the idea of careening out over the ocean. I held my breath, hoping. The captain stared straight to me and smiled. Mr. Cruz, I look at you and all of the men. You're the one who shows not the slightest hint of fear. Am I right? Yes, sir. I have no fear of heights. I know it, Mr. Cruz, and he did, for I'd served aboard his ship for more than two years, and he'd seen the ease with which I moved about the Aurora inside and out. Sir, said Mr. Chen, the lad shouldn't be the one to go, let me. And all at once the other crewmen were vigorously offering themselves for the job. Very good, very good, gentlemen, said the captain, but I think Mr. Cruz is really the best suited. If you're still willing, Mr. Cruz? Yes, sir. We'll not tell your mother about this. Agreed? I smiled and gave a nod. Is your harness snug? It is, sir. I was glowing with pride and hoped the others wouldn't see the flush in my cheeks. The captain came and checked the harness myself, his strong hands testing the straps and buckles. Be careful, lad, he told me quietly, then stepped back. All right, Mr. Cruz, hook yourself up to the davit, and we'll swing you over. 
You want to know what happens to Matt and the rest of the crew on the Airborne and who that pilot in the hot air balloon is and what he has to do with anything? Pick up a copy of Airborne from your school library, purchase one from your local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box below. I hope I will see you here again for another First Chapter Friday video and that you keep reading and maybe that you even keep writing. See you again next time. To continue reading Airborne by Kenneth Appel and the other great books by him, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday videos I have available for you on my channel. This week's mystery quote says, There was no shortage of fanciful stories about winged things. I like to think there was no end of things aloft in the sky unseen by us. Thanks so much for joining me on my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. I hope you'll come back again for more First Chapter Friday videos, brain breaks, and other great content. You can find me online at these places, which I've linked below. See you again next time, and happy reading!